Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Are You Ready to Garden? My name is Bill Lubick, and I'm a county agricultural agent for Middlesex County. And we've got a great topic for you tonight. We're going to talk about tree fruit production in your home garden. I'm very pleased today to have Megan Muehlbauer on with us. She's the agent in Hunterton County. Megan's been working on research related to tree fruit for over the past 10 years. Uh, she's become particularly interested in variety trials and promoting new novel varieties with excellent flavor and disease resistance. And she's going to share a little bit of her expertise with everyone tonight, and we're so glad to have her. And without further ado, Megan, it's all yours. Like Bill said, um, I've had over 10 years of experience with tree fruit production, um, and I am the Hunterton County Agricultural Agent. I primarily handle... Um, tree fruit production for commercial uh, farms in northern New Jersey, northern and central New Jersey. Um, but I also teach a number of tr um, home garden tree fruit production classes, which I'm going to be teaching you guys today. So now I first described this to you all as pomology, pomology in the back backyard. That's really just another word for tree fruit production. And it's really the science uh, of cultivating fruit. So. What do I mean by the science of cultivating fruit? I mean enhancing the quality of fruit, um, the actual production capacity, so what your yields are of fruit, and reducing those production costs. So that's a lot of what I actually do on a day-to-day -day, um, basis, and the research that I do is involved in teaching growers how to enhance their fruit, fruit quality, their fruit production, and their costs, um, but also for home gardeners, too. This is important. I would like to say before jumping into any specifics um, of the lecture today or of the talk today, um, the tree fruit growing is really one of the most challenging horticultural endeavors that you could really do, both as a commercial grower and as a backyard um, home gardener. <clears throat> it it takes a lot of knowledge and a lot of diligence and a lot of hard work. So just know that it's it's really rewarding to have um, any sort of tree fruit growing in your backyard and really enjoying apples and peaches and pears and all those things. But just know that it's a lot of hard work that goes into that. Now, there are two main um, ways that I wanted to uh, break up your fruit management or tree fruit management considerations when you're planning on uh, growing true fruit in your backyard. Now the first bunch you can kind of group together and that would be your site selection, your site preparation, and your planting and management considerations. This applies to all tree fruit. They all need, um, they're all pretty similar, these uh, thought processes that you're going to be um, moving forward with. Now, what differs a little based on each crop is what variety and rootstocks you're going to obviously select, uh, what your pollination requirements are going to be, uh, what sort of pruning methods that you're going to be doing for each one of those tree fruit, and um, the pest control that you have to handle for each of the tree fruit. So now there's a lot of different temperate tree fruit crops that you can grow um, in New Jersey. Uh, I'm going to be talking tonight about a uh, vast majority of them, but not every single one of them. Um, so I'm going to be talking about apples, peaches, and nectarines. They're lumped together. Plums, European pears, sweet and tart cherries, apricots. Um, not, I will not be talking about pawpaws or hardy kiwi, but feel free to send me an email or um, a message if you have some specific questions about those. They can be grown in New Jersey, but I'm not going to be talking about them today. But I did want to let you guys know that, yes, you can, in fact, grow them. So now, um, the first component of uh, establishing a little mini orchard in your backyard would be to make have your site selection or select your a proper site. So you, one of the main things that you want to focus in on is ensuring that you have good air drainage. Um, and I'm going to go into the details of what that means, but the reason behind that is because it will help you combat spring frosts. Now, it's not so much that our temperatures go really, really low in New Jersey and you can't be growing all these different tree fruits in New Jersey because it gets really cold. It's the spikes. It's the deep spikes in temperatures that you go way up and way down and way up and way down. That's what really makes it challenging to grow some of the tree fruits and challenging to not have to deal with frosts. Um, <clears throat> so 
in terms of looking for good air drainage, it means that you have adequate um, um, you have adequate air drainage through that site. The other thing you want to make sure that you have is adequate water drainage. You do not want water to be standing for more than 24 hours after a spring rain. There is no tree fruit that likes to have wet feet. You need to have good water drainage at your site. Uh, full sun is also very important. If you have a lot of forested area around your property, um, you want to make sure that you plant those trees in an area where they're going to get full sun. If you do not have full sun, you're not going to have fruiting buds. And if you don't have fruiting buds, then you won't have flowers and you won't have fruit. So that's very, very important. Um, I can't stress that enough. Ideally, if you can find a spot where you have northern exposure, <clears throat> You will, um, ha it will be less subject to spring frost um, because you're more likely to have snow cover, which is going to be an insulator uh, for those tree fruits. So keep that in mind. That's not necessarily, that's, that's not as much of um, an utmost necessity as these top three, though. Good air drainage, your good water drainage, and your full sun. So now when I talk about that good air drainage, I'm talking about having a little bit of a slope. If you have a spot with a slope, don't, don't grow your trees at the top of the slope on your property or at the very bottom of the slope. At the top of the slope, you're going to have cold, windy air. That's not going to be good for the tree fruit. And if you're at the bottom, then that's where the cold air settles, and that's where you're going to um, – trees can often get really hurt. Uh, the buds, the buds in the springtime because of early spring frost. You want a tr tr you want a spot and you want to plant your tree fruit. Pick a site that's in the middle of a slope because you'd actually be surprised at how different the temperatures are um, between that middle of the slope and the bottom of the slope or the top of the slope. Um, those just a couple degrees difference. I'm talking just three to five degrees difference can make or break having a crop on your tree. Um, and this year is actually was a perfect example of that for a lot of our commercial growers. And you could see that when they had at the bottom of slopes, if they, if they had part of their orchard at the lower end of the slope, they had absolutely no fruit that was growing on there. But if they had something that was growing in the middle of the slope, um, then they, were ha then they uh, did have their tree fruit um, buds that were retained. Now, like I was saying, this is what it would look like, and this is why site selection is so important, because if you have an early spring frost where the temperature dips really low, um, then you could potentially have your crop wiped out because you fraught, the flowers will just desiccate, um, and they will not make it, and you will not get adequate pollination. This can happen during a whole window of time, really, too, um, in the springtime. So it's important to make sure that your site is, a, is uh, well-drained um, in terms of both water and air. Now, the other thing to really consider, um, and this, this is a, site selection is involved in this, but it's also important um, to determine if you need fencing around that site or fencing if you have fencing around your yard because you need to protect those young trees from pests. Your number one pest um, in New Jersey is deer pressure especially when they're young trees, they'll nibble at those trees um, and they could just, all your hard work that you put into establishing the tree and the money that you, trees, and the money that you put in to put, um, buying those trees that you put in the ground can be completely wiped out in one night um, with deer. So you want to make sure that you have protection from that and other small animals too. So you can do this in the way of a big fence. You can just protect the small, um, just the little tree with a small cage around it. Uh, but as long as that tree is under three years old, you definitely want to make put extra care into protecting them. Then, um, you, once you have that site selected and you've prepped it for the wildlife and the animals that you might have to deal with, um, you want to look into preparing your soil. And you want to think about soil preparation two years in advance of planting. So oftentimes I get questions from both home gardeners or I'll get questions from commercial growers and they want to put trees in the ground as soon as possible. Now, the problem with that is that you have not set up your site. You have not, um, you haven't prepped your soil. They might have a site, but they haven't prepped their soil. They haven't done their soil test. This is incredibly important because you have a crop that you're putting in the ground and you're keeping it in the ground for possibly 15 to 20 years. And since you're putting all this time 
into this, you, you have such a time investment, you want to make sure that your soil is proper, is well prepared and fertilized um, prior to planting. So you want to start with a soil test that two years prior, you're looking at a fall soil test roughly. That's your first soil test. And you're, you want to get a complete soil test done and you want to see really the biggest thing you want to pay attention to is what is your pH, but you also want to look at your major um, nutrient levels. Then in the springtime, you want to, so you take that fall soil test, you get your results back, and then you look at what your pH is, and then you adjust your soil pH um, to get it into the range of 6 to 6.5. You'll also want to take that time to adjust your potassium and your phosphorus levels. Those aren't as, as critical as the pH, but this is a good time to get those adjusted, especially if they're way off early on. Um, you're also going to take that springtime, um, that one year prior to when you're planting, to smother any weeds, spray any herbicide if you decide to spray an herbicide, um, or till up that ground to kill off any major weeds that, or and minor weeds that you have on that site. You also want to make special, take special care to eliminate any perennial weeds. Um, talking about some of those ones that have lots of rise. Um, rhizomes um, and root systems that are really extensive. You want to eliminate those early on. Um, and then that gives you some time you can plant a cover crop. Um, if you really want to, you don't have to do this, but if you really want to go the extra mile in making sure that you're going to have a really good spot that is weed free for your home orchard site, you plant a cover crop such as rye or wheat or oats. And that really helps um, not only to combat the weed pressure, uh, but it helps to improve your soil structure and your organic matter um, of that site. Then in the fall, I would do a follow-up soil test to see where, you've, where you're at in terms of has your pH come up, has your phosphorus and your potassium levels come up um, to adequate levels so that your, um, everything's up to, up to speed for in the springtime when you plant your trees. So I just wanted to give you an idea. I'm sure you've seen this in some of the other talks. Um, but what your soil fertility analysis, what that will come back and what that looks like and what you want to focus in on. So obviously your soil pH, I pointed it out at the top here. You want it to be between 6 and 6.5. Um, so this pH here is perfect, spot on. They wouldn't need to do any adjustments. Um, then you want to look secondarily at your phosphorus and your potassium levels. And you want those to be at least in the medium range ideally in the optimum range. Um, if they're looking low or very low, then you definitely need to put down some amendments. Then your calcium and magnesium are also very important. Um, calcium more so, I would say, for a tree fruit is what you would, you want to make sure that that's a high enough level. I don't generally see magnesium deficiencies nearly as much as I'll see calcium deficiencies, which is an, it can be an issue in tree fruit. Uh, it can cause this pitting. Um, because you don't, calcium is really important to the cell wall structure. So specifically for apples, you know you've got that really good crunch to an apple. To be able to ensure that you have that good crunch, you have to have calcium in there to build up those cell walls. So the way that you would get calcium um, typically is through putting down lime if you're up in your soil pH, um, but you can also uh, put down some foliar, they have foliar calcium, and you can just put calcium down as some nutrients, one nutrient in and of itself, one elemental calcium, uh, if that's super, super low for you. But those are, the, those are the main ones that you want to pay attention to. Here's my first question break. Megan, I think we've answered quite a few of the questions. One person Got did it. talk about uh, trying to control bear damage, and I know up in North Ooh. you guys have more bear issues than we do where we're at. Um, what do you guys do to try to keep bears out of these orchards? That's a really good question. Um, I haven't actually had that one come my way. Uh, I, I, I honestly, that is, <laughs> I've never had that question. I'm not sure that you would really be able to do much of anything because you'd have the fruit there and that could be a real big issue. Okay, yeah, and um, so in um, programs where we talk about, you know, trying to control any of these animals, the problem with bear, of course, is that they can climb. And even if you put up a fence, uh, they can climb over fences and they can be up in trees. So it can be a real challenge. I, I don't know that we have any real good responses for that right now. So, um, but we 
do put fences up. Now, beekeepers, somebody just responded, beekeepers doing your right. That is true. Beekeepers put fences up around, and it does work. Mm -hmm. uh, but bears, you know, depending on how determined they are to get to those apples or get to that honey, they can still climb through. Mm -hmm. It all, also, just like deer, it depends on your population of animals. If you have a higher population, the animals are very hungry, then mm -hmm. it, they're going to get in almost any kind of barrier that you put up. So fences can help, though. Exclusion fences would be probably something we would recommend if you were in an area that had a very high bear population. And I would bet, though, if you were in, er in an area with a high bear population, you might also have a lot of wooded area around, so you'd also have to be careful to make sure that you're planting the trees away from the wooded area so that you get your light that you need. That's often an issue that I hear, trees not getting enough light and having no fruit. Somebody asked a question about eggshells for calcium. Mm -hmm. Any ideas for calcium sources for, for these trees if they need it? Well, that would be one. Um, I mean, you can just buy a foliar calcium that you could spray on the trees if you have a low cal, like you could, I would, oftentimes we will suggest spraying it as a foliar nutrient that you could just purchase. And then some of the others, Epsom salts is another, uh, that's more magnesium, but that's a solution if your pH is all right, but you have a low, you have low magnesium levels that growers will often spray that. Megan, we, we just, <laughs> <laughs> Got a series of questions about squirrels, groundhogs eating pears, <laughs> squirrels eating peaches, raccoons are also a problem. Uh, also have apples and cherries. How do I keep the animals away? Um, so, you know, somebody had mentioned here and using, you know, fencing, using electric fencing as well uh, mm -hmm. sometimes works. Um, if you have small animals, they can sometimes get through a lot of the different types of fencing that we put up. Yeah. Um, so it can be a real challenge. Do you have any suggestions for them on any of these other animals that you have problems with up in North Jersey? I know we just have a fa we just had a fact sheet that was put out on that, and that would probably be the best resource. Which I think trapping was one of the main methods that they were suggesting um, in that um, fact sheet that was just put out by Brooke Maslow. Trapping is one method. Um, that we use. There are some deterrents that are out there for depending on what the animal is. Uh, we have found that trapping can work as long as you're consistent with it. Um, you got to take the animals uh, to be transported away from that area because they'll be back home before you are. Mm -hmm. if you don't take them far enough away. And there are people within each township and county that sometimes will help do damage control for you. So um, it's good to uh, find a person that can help you with the control methods there. Um, but some of these animals are just very hard to control because of the size of them, no matter what barrier you put up. And what we found is, um, as we mentioned before, is that some controls f will work for a certain period of time, but then if the animals get used to it, um, then they'll find a way around that particular control method. We see fencing as, as one good method. I would also suggest you try to stay as far away from the tree line again as possible so that they're not little little animals are less likely to want to run in um an open yard field kind of area because they might get picked because they're more likely to get picked off by um hawks and that sort of thing. The other thing that we do I would strongly suggest um now that we're discussing it, that came to me, is making sure that you have the area well mowed around the trees because if you don't have your area well mowed, then it's easier for those small animals to hide in there. And again, if you just kind of, if some of what, it does not hurt um, to rely on the natural pred predators that you have in the area uh, for some of those smaller animals. Megan, that's a, that's a really good point. Just to mention real quickly that we did that with some of the gardens that we have and where we've had trees in the past. And just by making sure you mow regularly around that and those, those trees and plants are out in the full sun and mm -hmm. they're within uh, eyesight view of red tail hawks and other predators in the area, I'm going to have better try to control them. And somebody did mention about chain link, chain link fence doesn't keep squirrels out. No, it doesn't. I mean, there's uh, other types of fencing you can use, but it is, it's tough to keep all of these animals out of almost any area um, if yeah. you have a population. So, but yeah. hopefully, 
predators and fencing and, you know, a combination of some deterrence. There's different types of uh, deterrence we use with different smells, but you got to reapply them after the rain. Otherwise, they don't work. Moving on. So now some of the other, before we start delving into the specifics of um, each specific type of tree fruit crop, um, I'm going to go into some of the other uh, planting and management decisions that uh, once you have that site selected and you have your ground prepped, you should take into consideration. That's important. Now, purchasing of the plant material. I'm going to go into the cultivars that I would suggest for home gardeners uh, a little later on, but I wanted to drive home the point that it's important to purchase your plant material from a reputable nursery. Um, we have a fact sheet actually. I could probably I could send this on to uh, Bill to post, um, or you guys can find it. We actually have a fact sheet on nurseries and nursery dealers for tree fruit in New Jersey. Um, I would also suggest when you're looking to a specific nursery that you should look to see what their statement of policies are and whether they're part of um, the National Clean Plant Network. And feel free to ask them those questions because. Tree fruit is propagated clonally, so when you have a virus specifically, it can move really easily um, from tree to tree. If you're just cutting from that for that initial tree, you keep moving the plant, moving the virus on with that plant material without, unless they're cleaning it. Um, they have found that this is a huge issue in apple production, um, and it's led to some serious apple decline. So now they're really beefing up um, their policies at some of these nurseries to make sure that you have clean plant material that you're putting in the ground. Because really, you're investing money into this and you want to make sure that you have the best plant material possible. So I would strongly suggest that you get to know your nursery and you, you ask them these questions, um, have that dialogue. So in terms of pollination, you have to make sure that you have adequate pollination. Now, obviously, from tree, each different type of tree fruit is going to have... Um, they're either going to self-pollinate or they'll cross-pollinate. Now, if they cross-pollinate, um, you'll need to have two different cultivars, most often, of that type of tree fruit. But adequate pollination, you want to make sure that you have those cultivars that are they're overlapping in bloom time, uh, that you have viable pollen, and that those two trees are within close proximity, if they are trees that need to be cross-pollinated. Now, I'll go over that, but also that's another thing to that once you have chosen a specific variety that you want, um, you should make sure, you should talk to the nursery and make sure with them that they have, that you know what other plant, what other tree you will need to be able to have adequate cross-pollination, or if it's self-pollinated, you don't have to worry about that. Now, the other thing um, that's important to take into account is that all of these are being pollinated by bees, all of these tree fruit. So certain years, you're not necessarily going to have great pollination, and there could be different reasons for that, unless, of course, you're going around and you're pollinating it with your fingers, um, going from flower to flower. Temperatures have to be above 55 to 60 degrees. Now, that was an issue in several... In, um, in this spring, we had some days that really were not that warm. If it's not up to 55, 60 degrees during flowering or it just starts to open and then the temperatures go down, those bees are not moving and you're not moving the pollen around. So that could be an issue um, if you're not seeing adequate fruit set. If you don't have um, any wind or, or you, you, you do not want to have wind, um, those bees don't want to be fighting the wind to be pollinating. Um, Excess dandelions, you don't want to have an excess of dandelions. That also harkens back to keep the area mowed around it because you don't want those bees working up the dandelions and not paying attention to the flowers. The other thing to keep in mind is if you decide that you want to spray some sort of pesticide on your tree fruit, which is totally fine for their home gardener um, uh, types of uh, tree fruit sprays that they have out, it is really important to read the label and make sure you're not using anything that has an insecticide during that time that is bloom time because you could be killing the bees that you want to be pollinating your tree fruit. So that's just an important thing to keep in mind if you decide to go that route. Another just piece of the pollination um, 
puzzle here. So when you open up different nursery catalogs, often they'll have something that looks like this, a pollination chart. And so if you look at a certain variety that you want to be planting, you look at that variety, for example, Bartlett, and you can see which varieties uh, you should be planting to make sure that you have pollination with that Bartlett tree. And then it'll tell you which ones not to use um, or which ones will not pollinate that particular uh, Bartlett tree. So it's important to pay attention. Or it's important to know that a Bartlett will not cross with a Bartlett, obviously, or a number of other ones. So it's if you have that information, and this is also widely available online, I actually got this particular chart from Adams County Nursery, which we deal really closely with at Rutgers, and they have some fantastic information in their catalogs. Um, they have this information is out there, and it's important to be acquainted with it um, for all of your tree fruit, even after this lecture. It's good to get uh, refreshed on it. Now, in terms of the time of planting, I would suggest, and oftentimes you'll get the trees uh, as dormant trees in the springtime before they've leafed out. That's oftentimes how the nursery likes shipping them. Um, and they'll often also ship them as bare roots, so you don't have any soil around those roots. Um, so those trees that are dormant, they can be planted in the springtime as soon as the ground can be tilled up. If those trees arrive, and they often do, before it's really ready to till up the ground, you would place them in cold storage and make sure that your roots are covered um, in moist soil or sawdust or some sort of mix of sawdust and sand. But make sure it's moist. Oftentimes, these trees are going to come with that, or they'll come with newspaper that's in different pieces, and that's moist. That's fine. I would keep it in a basement or in a garage, somewhere that's cool. Your other option, if you don't have those spaces as an option, is you can heal them in. And what that just means is it's in that picture right here. You just till up a little bit um, of soil lightly, and you just get contact with the roots and the soil. Just lightly healing them in is basically... Um, just taking your, the heel of your foot and just pushing it down, um, roots against the soil, and it'll just keep them going, um, keep, the, keep those roots moist until you're ready to plant it. You only want to do that for a couple days, though. That's only a short-term solution. Now, just prior to planting, um, you want to soak the roots of the tree in water for about four hours. And the other thing you want to do is you want to prune back the top of the tree. About a quarter of the top of the tree you want to prune back. Because what you want is ideally a one-to-one -one root to shoot ratio. You do not want so much photosynthesis going on that you're burning out the roots. Um, it, it keeps everything in balance. Oftentimes these trees, they've done an amazing job in the nursery and they're growing really, really well. Um, but you're going to stress the tree out if you have too much top growth on it. So you want to cut, often cut back about a quarter of that before, your plant, before planting. Now in terms of digging of the hole, um, you want to dig a hole that's big enough to ensure that you're accommodating the roots and you're thinking about that in both horizontally and vertically. Uh, you want to make sure it's so deep, you want to make sure it's deep enough so that you can get, um, so that the graft union, which I'm going to go into the details of what that is, but you want that to be two to three inches above the soil line after the soil settles. So you're going to want it to be about six to eight inches above the soil line, figuring that you're going to have a couple inches of settling. Now the graft union, you're going to see this kind of lump, and I'll show you in a, another picture. It's going to be low, low on the tree. That's where you have this root system, which is different. Um, is connected or gra grafted as if what we do with skin grafts, it knits with this scion, which is your, co your cultivar that you're interested in. So this is actually derived from a different tree, the top as the bottom of this tree. Um, and then you're going to see, so where they've knitted together, the scion and the rootstock, that is called your graft union. And that's, and that's what you want to be two to three inches above the soil line after the soil settles. Now the whole reason for that so if you have it too deep and you've actually planted the scion in the ground, then it's going to scion root, and then there's no sense in having the rootstock because you've had, you have rooting of the scion. We have this rootstock as part of this tree because it imparts special characteristics, often disease resistance, dwarfing characteristics, um, 
drought tolerance, those sorts of things. So these, these root, this root system has characteristics that the top of the tree does not have. And, sent, and we have figured out that you can um, actually cut and graft and knit these two pieces, um, two trees together, and you're going to have um, an improved tree that's uh, even more uh, viable in, uh, throughout the world, really, but here in New Jersey. So um, just that's your little background on the root, root stocks. It's very important. It's a little complicated, but it's important to know that you just want to have that graft union two to three inches above the soil line. Then you want to fill the hole up with soil, um, and you want to tamp it down with your feet, and then fill it up with even uh, a little bit more soil. That helps to settle it out earlier on. It's really all about making sure that you have it at the right area and that you don't have so much settling that you're going to have this big gaping hole in the ground still after the soil moistens up and settles down. The other thing you should do is you should kind of pull the tree up a little bit and jiggle the roots, and that ensures that you don't have any air pockets in this hole in the ground. And then the last thing, and arguably the most important, is making sure that you give it a good drink of water after you've done that. Now, another component um, that's important to keep in mind if you have tree fruit is that you're going to need to thin that tree fruit um, every year. And that goes for all different types of tree fruit. And what that means is that the tree is putting on way more fruit than it can, act, than, than it can actually handle. Um, so you need to probably thin off, I would say, 50% of the fruit. You're actually going to pull it off. And I would pull it off early in the season. So after you've had the fruit set and you see little fruitlets like this one up here, this apple fruitlet, you're going to take off about 50% of those fruitlets. Same goes for peaches and plums. If you do not thin, then you ha often have so much fruit that the limbs will break. I hear that often, especially with peaches. They put on a ton of fruit, um, and they get so big that the limbs start breaking once the fruit sizes up. The other issue is that it... Um, if you don't thin, you'll have very small fruit. You'll have little marbles as opposed to nice big peaches or nice big apples because it just the tree does not have enough energy to be able to create, to be able to grow um, all these fruitlets to be lar large enough. Um, and the last thing is that it also um, can make it difficult for the tree to have a return bloom. So if you have Apple trees inherently are biennial, so they'll put on a big crop one year, and then the next year they'll have next to no crop. If you thin off about half of the fruit every single year, then it'll even things out, and you're going to get a you you should get a pretty good crop every single year if you do that. The other thing to pay attention to this is another caution uh, caution statement for if you decide to go the route of spraying any insecticides. You want to make sure that you do not spray the insecticide carbaryl after you have thinned um, the fruit. Or, or look at the, the package of the tree fruit spray that you'll see in Home Depot or whatever. If it has carbaryl as one of the ingredients, you want to make sure that you're doing, that you spray that on prior to doing any thinning, because that will actually thin some of the fruit. That is a commercial thinner that is used. So um, if, if you do that after thinning, if you spray that down, then you might have no fruit. So be very, very careful. Another thing to keep in mind is that you um, might want to consider some sort of small irrigation system. If you don't do that, then just make sure that you're watering these trees about they really need one and a half inches of rainfall throughout their um, late spring through the summer season to make sure um, that they're alive and well. Uh, most orchards in northern New Jersey and central New Jersey have some sort of irrigation system. Um, and during dry spells like we're dealing with right now, you would definitely want to have that irrigation system on. Or you want to make sure that you're watering those trees so that they're able to um, maintain their vitality. Even more so important for new trees. Questions? Megan, there's a question on thinning. Will thinning of fruit stop the peaches from falling off the tree? No. No, that, I mean, that can happen for a number of different reasons. And you could, you, if you have rots or things like that, the fruit could fall off of the tree. If they're really ripe and you haven't picked them, um, they could fall off of the tree for that reason. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say 
thinning will stop that, but thinning is very important to on peaches especially because they consistently overproduce. Now well, let's get a little more specific. Uh, we're going to look at the varieties and rootstock selection, pollination, pruning, and pest control of different specific tree fruit crops that I discussed. So we're going to start with palm fruit. Palm fruit, when I say that, I'm talking about pears and apples because they're, they're, rela they're very related in terms of, um, I would say, specifically the diseases and pests that you deal with on palm fruit. Um, but there's also some structural uh, similarities to them. In the same, they're in the same family in that respect. So now going back to that variety rootstock selection, um, this is what it, this is again what it looks like when I'm talking about your rootstock, this bottom part, that's that root system that's so important. Um, and this is how, uh, what all modern apple trees and really all modern tree fruit is comprised of. You have a root system and you choose that root system for specific reasons. They often don't have any fancy name to them. Um, I'm gonna go into what to look for, but they're not as catchy as Macintosh apple or Suncrisp or Honeycrisp apple. Your scion is those apples that you're interested in or the tree fruit that you're interested in. So um, that's, the, that's the variety name, that's the um, catchy cultivar name that people are used to. Um, and this right here is your graft union, that, that point at which they come, come together. I was looking for my little pointer, but. Like I said, your scion is your apple variety of interest. Um, now, you should choose your varieties based on your growing site, and I would say everything that I'm going to be talking about today uh, will more than likely grow well in New Jersey. Um, but be careful when you're looking at different nursery catalogs that you see where those varieties might be um, suggested, where people would suggest to grow those varieties in. Um, varieties that are better suited for Washington State or Oregon might not be well suited for growing in New Jersey. So that's important, an important thing to consider, although we can grow quite a few of them in New Jersey. Um, the other thing that I would say for home gardeners that is incredibly important to pay attention to is do, does the variety that you're looking at have disease resistance or can you find a variety that that particular nursery is selling that has disease resistance because that will really help you manage um, a lot of issues that you're going to come across um, in terms of management. Here are some of these varieties and I have them listed from early ripening to late ripening. If they have a little asterisk by them, then they um, have multiple sources of disease resistance. I'll go into some of the diseases that uh, they're being resistant to, but I'm thinking of your big ones are apple scab, fire blight, um, and cedar apple rust. Those are the big uh, diseases that you're going to see, and those are the major ones that breeders have bred resistance for that I would suggest you look for. Um, they're not necessarily the most well-known varieties, I know. Um, you might not know Liberty or Freedom or Williams Pride, but those are, these are the varieties. They taste excellent. I have um, eaten nearly all of them myself. They're just as good as a Golden Delicious that you might like um, or a Honeycrisp, but they're far easier to grow in terms of management of, those disease, of that disease resistance. Places where you might see them, if you want to try some of these varieties before you plant them, would be local farmers markets. Um, often commercial growers, just like backyard uh, growers of tree fruit, want to have disease re some disease resistance in their planting so they don't have to spray as much if they're a grower that's putting on um, some commercial sprays. So just to go into a little bit of detail on a couple of the varieties I wanted to kind of showcase, Sansa is one. This is a gala-like variety, so that's what it would, um, it reminds me most of. So it has that sweet flavor with just a little bit of acidity and that yellow flesh, which is really common in galas. It has tolerance to apple scab and fire blades, so those are two major diseases that you, you might still see them, but you won't see them as they won't be as prevalent uh, in this particular tree. It also has resistance to powdery mildew and cedar apple rust. Liberty is a, another, this is an excellent apple. Um, it's a later season apple. It has, so 
It ripens in October. Uh, it has really nice, crisp white flesh and um, more of a sweet tart flavor. This, um, this is an apple that actually improves in flavor with storage, uh, which is kind of interesting. And it has lots of resistance. Uh, apple scab, cedar apple rust, fire blight, and powdery mildew. Gold Rush is another excellent apple. Um, I think it's a little under underrated. Um, I'm hoping that it uh, gets more and more popular. I've been seeing more and more of it, and I know our growers in New Jersey do grow Gold Rush and Liberty, in fact. Um, Gold Rush was bred. Um, Rutgers University was part of a breeding program uh, that was involved in the release of this apple. It has pale yellow, yellow flesh. It has a very complex flavor, sweet acid, um, and it has a firm, crisp texture. This is also an apple that's used in uh, hard cider, uh, if anyone is interested or has tried any of that and seen that industry kind of boom, blossoming in New Jersey. Um, there are some growers that are growing it just for that purpose. It does also have resistance to fire blight and apple scab, uh, and it also improves its flavor after you store it. So just storing it in a plastic bag um, in your refrigerator for several weeks can really improve the flavor, interestingly enough. Just to uh, go back to talking about rootstocks a little bit. So you've got your cultivar chosen. Now, in, in looking at the rootstock, just to get an idea of the importance of having these rootstocks is they have one, they have disease, res many have disease resistance, which is fantastic, and resistance or drought tolerance. They also help to dwarf the tree. So it keeps the tree a reasonable size. Um, and I'm looking at really bud nine is one of my favorite ones because it really keeps a small, compact tree. So it's not huge. It's not overtaking your yard, but you're still able to have lots of really great fruit. It's not taking away from how efficiently that tree is yielding. And in fact, it might even yield more fruit because these trees, if they're really large, if you were to just grow a golden delicious apple on its own roots, then it'll get really, really huge. This is like its standard 100% size. If you grow that golden delicious apple, breeders realize that if they took it and they took a piece of that apple wood and they grafted it onto one of these rootstocks, you can have that same apple, but in a much more manageable um, tree shape and tree height. Uh, so that's one of the huge perks of having these dwarfing rootstocks. This is an example of this tree right here that is on a dwarfing rootstock. This is probably only six to eight feet tall. So I'd much rather pick a tree that was six to eight foot tall than, to, than something that was 15 foot tall. Um, 10 to 15 foot tall, which I have seen trees that are that can be really, really huge. You don't necessarily need as much laddering, and it and it doesn't take over your entire yard. So um, it's an important thing to consider, and an important thing to understand about um, tree fruit. And that also teaches you keep make sure you keep that graft union above the ground because if you do have that graft union too low, then you'll end up rooting your scion wood, and then it acts as if it was a seedling because those roots are really vigorous. So some of the um, common rootstocks that I would suggest for home gardeners, when you're purchasing a tree, look and try to um, try to purchase a tree that is on an M9 rootstock or an M26 rootstock. Both of them are very dwarfing rootstocks, so they'll keep it, M9 even more so, that'll keep it the tree about 10, 8 to 10 foot tall. You do need to have soil with a good water holding capacity, but that's kind of standard what you would want to have. Um, that just basically means that it's not as drought tolerant, the M9. Um, M26 is not particularly dr drought tolerant either, but that's also really good dwarfing rootstock, and both of them impart disease resistance, which also makes your lives a lot easier, one less thing to worry about um, with, these, with these backyard uh, orchards. Now pollination again. So for apples, they need to be, they are cross-pollinated. So you need to have two apple trees, two different cultivars to be able to produce fruit. Now I should back up though and say that you can have one apple cultivar and you can have a crab apple, but they have to be blooming at the same time. Um, and 
you should double check that they're compatible too. But generally, if they're blooming at the same time, or you know, um, then then it's going to be okay. Generally, what they do with apples is they characterize the crab apples as being early, mid, and late season pollinators. So you have to look at what the cultivar you're interested in, whether that's an early season bloomer, a mid season bloomer, or a late season bloomer, and then you'll be able to match it up. But it's always good to double check with the nursery or with some of our fact sheets that we have out. Reasons for inadequate pollination, so there are lots. This, ha this is such a common occurrence, unfortunately, but if you just don't have enough vigor with the tree, um, if the rootstock is incompatible, that's not so much going to, that will not be, I wouldn't imagine it to be uh, the case, really, with all the rootstock work that's been done now. Inadequate light, that's, that's a huge issue, and that's really, you might not, that's really hearkening to you're probably not getting good bloom on that tree. If you have low temperature injury, that's also killing those blossoms likely, and then you are running into issues there. Over fertilization, um, that means that you're not getting enough blossoms because you have so much uh, shoot growth that's going on with those trees. And when I say over fertilization, I really mean nitrogen. Um, be Pay careful attention to how old your tree is and how much nitrogen it really needs. Um, and you can look at, there's plenty of fact sheets out to be able to get that information. Um, and also excessive moisture. So this is just a, a little bit of a schematic to show you where those trees that I pointed out fall um, when you're looking at early season, mid season, and late season pollinators. So Liberty, um, if you were to plant that tree, these are the different pollinators. This is not all inclusive of all of the trees that will pollinate Liberty, um, but it is some of them. Uh, mid-season pollinators for some of those others that I mentioned, and then our late-season pollinators right here. Keep in mind, though, I didn't include them, but you can have, again, you can have crab apples, an early, a mid, and a late-season crab apple um, to pollinate your cultivars that you're interested in. Now, in terms of pruning, um, your optimal time to prune apple trees would be February, March. Uh, you would start with your older older apple trees and then, um, or the older your apple tree is, I should say, the earlier you can start to prune them. Thinking January 1, if you have a really old apple tree, you can get away with pruning it then. Really old meaning like 15 years old. But if you have an apple tree that's pretty young, may, maybe under uh, five years or so, then I would prune it closer to March. And that's because it's gone fully dormant. It takes a while for some of those small trees to get, go fully dormant. This is really the case for all tree fruit, I would say, which, which things, which cuts you should make first. You always want to cut out your dead wood, your diseased wood, your damaged wood first. Anything that looks really weak. If you have a really... Um, bad angle of the branch, something where your branches are crisscrossing, you want to take those out. Those are your first choices. Um, any suckers, so those rootstock, so the rootstock portion will still try to grow up its own tree. Um, so that portion below the graft union, any branches that are growing below the graft union, you want to cut out because those are not your cultivar that you're interested in. And that will sometimes, sometimes those rootstocks are so vigorous, they'll just take over the entire tree. Um, any branches that just look out of place, uh, branches that look really crowded, um, and some of the oldest, really, really old wood, you can cut that out first. So then after you've cut that out, if you have anything left, there's a couple other um, simple rules for pruning apple trees, keeping in mind that when you're pruning an apple tree, you're pruning to a central leader. And you want that apple tree, you think about an apple tree to be pruned kind of like a Christmas tree, where you have that single leader at the top, and then you want it to taper down. Um, every year, you roughly uh, will take out two to three of the largest limbs in the top two-thirds of the tree. That's one of the easiest cuts to make. Hand in hand with that would be, you would use a two to one rule to make that decision. And I think I have, I might not have a picture of it. So the two to one rule just means that if the branch coming off of your main, main trunk 
is greater than one half the size of your main trunk, then you want to pull it out. Then that is too big, especially if it's in the top two thirds of the tree. That will just start to go off and kind of create its own tree there. So anything that's really, really two or three branches that are really large in that top two thirds, you want to pull them out. Um, you don't want to create stubbing cuts, meaning you want to make sure that you take that, if you cut a branch off, cut it all the way back to where the trunk of the tree is. Don't cut it halfway and leave a big stub. That's not, that's not a good idea. Um, and then just if you have a couple of, if it still looks kind of busy in that tree, then you simplify branches a little bit. Um, going back to things that are kind of crossing or just look out of place, branches that are totally drooping down. If your branch is drooping down, you're not going to get good light into that branch. So consider also what the, how much light you think you're getting into that tree um, or onto those branches. If you have branches or that are being shaded out by bigger branches above, then you should prune them out because you're not going to get uh, good light on there. And if you don't get good light, you won't get fruiting buds. Branches that are growing straight up um, are also generally something that you want to prune out because if they're growing, if they're growing straight up, then they are shading the branches below them out. Um, all the while keeping maintaining that central leader. So here's here's a nice picture, um, and it really it it might sound more complicated than it really is. Honestly, just pruning, just taking five, two to five branches out of a tree every year is helping it. That helps reinvigorate the tree and renew the tree so they get new growth and new flower buds and that's all, all those good things. So um, I have on the left side what an unpruned tree often looks like. What will end up happening nine times out of ten is you see this umbrella effect. You see all these branches growing up at the top and they're going straight up. You really only want one of them because if you're pruning to a central leader, a single leader, you want to prune everything out and you just want to have that single leader. Um, that helps to maintain your shape, but that also helps to prevent shading. If you have all those branches, if you think about it, and they've all put on a bunch of leaves, that's going to shade out everything below it. And then you only have fruit in the top, then you'll only have fruit in that top portion of the tree. I just saw a question of why... Um, do you prune, let me just, because this is relevant, I'll hold off on that. Um, I think it was that there, why do you prune the top two or three branches out of yes. the top portion of the tree? It. It's because exactly. you want to maintain that pyramidal shape. Your trees are going to, like I just showed you, they're going to tend to put on a lot of branches in the top, and they tend to put a lot of branches on the top because that's where the light is. They are growing toward the light. That is where you're getting all that photosynthesis going on. And that's just inherently what the tree is going to do. So if you keep renewing and taking two or three branches out of the top of the tree, and that's where you're focusing in on, then you're going to get fruiting lower down. You don't want to have all of your uh, fruit at the top of the tree for many reasons. It'll break branches. You don't really want to be climbing to the top of the tree every time. You want your fruit to be lower um, in the tree because then it makes everything a lot more manageable. So this is the central leader. That This is, a, this is um, what you're shooting for, what you want it to look like, that one branch. So you saw what it inherently will try to often, there'll be lots of other branches. You can see there's one cut that was made here. You could arguably take another cut out of here to have your two or three cuts. You see, because you're just going to, with all that light, that's where the vigorous branches are going to be in the top, top portion of the tree. Now, moving on to some pest control, I'm going to go over abiotic injuries first, and then we have a little, we have a nice video, actually, um, from one of our previous agents. He's going to touch upon a couple of these issues, but um, specifically the frost, frost issue in trees. There are lots of different abiotic issues um, that you'll see in all different tree fruits. So this will be coming back, this winter injury issue. Um, where you have cracking often in the trunks of trees. So one way to handle that, um, and actually it's a way to handle several insect issues too, is to paint a mixture of um, white latex paint, one-to-one -one of latex paint and water, and you paint the bottom third of the tree with that. And that helps to prevent winter injury because 
um, and cracking of the trunk, actually. And if you look closely in the orchards that you go to, if you guys go to a pick your own orchard, you go to a farm stand and see apples nearby, you'll often see that the bottom portions of the tree are painted with white paint. And that is to prevent winter injury, and it's also um, a way to combat different insects. Other issues that you often see, you'll see hail and sun scald and cork. Um, sun scald being, I think I have a picture of that next. Yeah, so sun scald is literally sunburn. And it's not really a huge issue, I would say, or it doesn't have to be a major issue. It's not going to ruin the integrity of your fruit. But if you really, really want to have a nice, perfect fruit, what you can do um, is to spray it with clay, actually, like a liquid clay, which I think you can get, a kaolin clay. It's just a simple dried clay that you mix with water. And then that will actually act as like a sunscreen um, for, your, for your tree fruit, for your apples specifically, um, is where you often see this. Uh, ways to minimize your disease pressure. Now, what you want to pay attention to, and he's going to talk about this in the video a little bit. He'll say different timings for if you're going to be putting down different sprays, organic or non-organic sprays. Um, you want to be paying attention to what the phenology or what the buds are looking like on the tree. Actually, that's my next slide. So what he, he, I don't think he goes into a lot of these, but ways to minimize your disease pressure. Some of the basics are the pruning that I mentioned before, Make sure, making sure that you prune out your dead wood because that can often hold um, lots of these fungi and bacteria and microorganisms. Also making sure that you rake up and you destroy leaves um, and diseased fruit in the fall after your harvest and getting rid of them because all of that can actually harbor different fungal spores and bacterial inoculum um, that can reinfect the tree. Um, and then familiarizing yourself with disease and insect cycles um, as they relate to the growth cycle of the tree. And what that really means is I would say above all um, is to pay attention to what timing um, your, your tree is at, what, what critical time point your tree fruit is. So is it just beginning to um, turn to silver tip? Uh, or is it, is it pushing out a little bit? Do you see a little more leaves? Are you in full bloom? Um, pay attention to that, and then if you decide that you're going to have some sort of pest management strategy, oftentimes you need to do them early, early on in the season as a preventative um, during several of these critical time points, which they will go into. And uh, I'll, I'll leave it to you for the video, Dave. Hi, I'm Bill Tejan with Rutgers Cooperative Extension, and in my position as a county ag agent, I teach master gardener classes in New Jersey on growing tree fruit in a home garden. I have received many questions about growing apples. Apple growing in New Jersey, we have at least 20 to 22 different disease and insect pests that affect apples. And if you, as a homeowner, decide to grow apples, you should be aware of this, and you can go to your local extension office and learn about what control measures are available for the home gardener. And today I've brought along some problematic samples of what you can expect. This fruit, as you can see, is infected by the apple scab fungus, number one fungal disease of apples in the entire world. And it can be spotted like this and on some varieties and can cause cracking. This, once it cracks, it can be open to other fungal infections. Here we have two fruit affected by summer diseases termed sooty blotch and fly speck. Both are caused by fungi and they only live on the surface of the fruit. They do not affect the internal quality of the fruit. So a homeowner who wants to limit his use of fungicides can stop spraying after apple scab season and have perfectly acceptable fruit from the culinary standpoint, but have this cosmetic defect. The specimen here is one of two apple pests that can cause wormy fruit. This happens to be coddling moth, where the insect lays the egg directly on the surface of the apple hatches and burrows into the apple, which goes directly to the seed cavity. Telltale sign of coddling moth is a large hole, entrance hole with the sawdust around it. This can be controlled by insecticides, but in a homeowner situation, this may or may not be a problem. These uh, sigmoid curves that you see on this fruit was caused by the European apple sawfly, which emerges as an adult in the spring, just as the apples come into bloom. The eggs are laid on the surface of the very young apple, 
hatches and burrows through the flesh just beneath the skin. A insecticide application is necessary just prior to bloom to control damage done by this insect. Here we have an example of an apple that man has no control over the injury. This calloused area on the upper half of the fruit was caused by a late season frost injury either during bloom or right after bloom where the tissues just beneath the skin were injured resulting in this callous surface. It's important to de properly identify disorders in apples to avoid unnecessary pesticide spraying. Even though this apple looks um, unacceptable, definitely in the commercial market, but for the homeowner, the skin could be peeled and still utilized in sauce or apple pies. The few specimens I've just shown you is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to insect and disease problems with growing apples in New Jersey. So if you as a homeowner plan to grow apples, you have to consider the commitment in time labor and dollars to grow fruit in your own backyard. You could think of this as getting a household pet. And there's also the other aspect you can do is go to your local roadside stand or pick your own operation in New Jersey and get the best apples New Jersey has to offer. Megan, do you want to take one question here? Surely. Okay, so someone's asking about their app. They have an apple tree that's about 10 years old uh -huh. and it's, it hasn't been blooming for the for the past four years, so um, you want to take a stab at that? Assuming that you do have flowers on it, uh, I would say a good possibility is that you just have not had the pollination from the bees, um, that they haven't been around, and that could be um, due to, we've had, I would say probably for the past four years, we've had some really erratic um, weather in the springtime, and that has actually led to uh, our commercial growers have had some serious issues with getting pollination. Now, um, that's assuming that you had flowers, but you did not actually have any fruit. If you had fruit that was set and you could see the fruit, um, there could be there could also be some frost issues. So one way to see if your flower, if your fruit has actually been pollinated adequately, um, and if it, they're all those number of reasons, the bees are one reason, the frost, the cool, cool springs are another reason for not being pollinated adequately. But to kind of narrow it down and see if you've even had pollination is when you see those little fruitlets on your apple tree, you can open up that fruitlet and you look inside, and you should be able to see the little seeds, even if the fruit looks like really, really small. Um, you should see about four or five different seeds in that. If you don't see any seeds at all, little seeds, then you're not getting pollination. So there's some sort of pollination issue that you have. Um, and that's challenging. You want to have bees in the area. That's one, one issue. You could try to do some hand pollinations if the flowers are low enough, but that would be my good check, and then you could understand whether it is post-pollination that you're looking at some sort of issue, which I would say probably it could be a fertility. If it's getting pollinated but not they're not holding on, then I would say you probably have some sort of fertility issue or some sort of uh, fungal bacterial issue like that. But if they're not, if you don't see those seeds in those little fruitlets, then you're probably you're not getting pollinated. So um, then you look at trying to get adequate bee, bee working or hand pollinating in that case. Thanks. Another question that you just alluded to, and I know you covered it a little bit, but best time to fertilize or what, uh, to fertilize uh, apples and peaches and pears uh, just for timing so that we can uh, maximize fruit production? You want to do it in the springtime, right around flower, flowering time is when you want to um, be putting down your fertilizer. But keep in mind that I would suggest taking your soil test uh, in the fall prior to the springtime so that you know exactly what you need um, during the spring. And oftentimes, I would say that if you've had your ground prepped and you did your uh, uh, potassium and phosphorus amendments and your lime amendments, before you put the trees in the ground, then you really most likely won't really have to do those amendments once you, um, for the lifetime of that tree, the thing that you're going to want to be putting down are micronutrients and your nitrogen every year. Those are the big things that I have growers do if they have made sure that they prepped their spot. 
uh, in advance of planting. Another quick question is uh, someone had asked about growing uh, either dwarf cherries or any of the dwarf varieties in, in like half barrels or smaller in, a, in, in containers in general yeah. if possible. Absolutely, you can do that. I would say you have to make sure that you that your um, uh, what you're growing is dwarfing. It is in fact dwarfing. Um, and the other thing, so you want that to be dwarfing. If you're growing an apple or a peach, then there are specific varieties that are columnar varieties, and I would suggest growing them if you're going to grow those in a container because that helps to keep things more manageable. And they're going to tend to have a habit where they're growing straight up. And they're and, and you know breeders have been um, smart enough that they have come up. They've actually bred these varieties to specifically be grown in container systems. So you should look. Look for that specifically. Um, off the top of my head, I know Sweeten Up is a variety of peach that is bred to be a columnar, that is a columnar variety. Um, and make sure, of course, like I said before, that you have a dwarfing root system for any of that that's being grown in a container system. But you can absolutely do that successfully. I've seen people do it. Thanks, Megan. Now, in terms of the pest control, and this is really uh, this. This holds true for uh, all different tree fruit. Really, is dormant oil is one of your one of your best tools that you have. Um, spraying that at half inch green can really control mites, scale, and parapsilla, uh, which I'll touch upon briefly when I get to the pears. So that really helps control that really early on. That helps you to control your insect issues. But you have to remember. Put it on your calendar, and you got to remember to um, spray it early on because you're spraying it as a preventative. Um, you're not spraying it as, oh my gosh, I have tons of mites and scale. Like, what do I do? Um, you got to make sure that you get it on early, and then it can be really quite effective. Um, apple maggot is one issue um, that is seen. Uh, it emerges from the soil. Um, so what you really want to do uh, is to you want to pick up and destroy any fruit that has fallen to the ground. So it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean that your fruit is infested, but by picking up and destroying that fruit that it's fallen to the ground, then you're reducing infestations for the following year. So it's not going back into the ground. So that simple tap, the simple just simply picking up the fruit and destroying it and throwing it away is going to really set you up um, for success or more possible success, I should say, uh, against this particular issue. Um, Round-headed apple tree borer. Now, this is a common one with backyard apples. Uh, the larva will actually feed under the bark, and then it produces these tunnels, um, and then it'll overwinter in the trunk, and then it'll keep disrupting the movement of nutrients and water. It's one of those things that, since often backyard homeowners uh, growers of tree fruit are not spraying all these um, insecticides or any insecticides, then this is one of those things that can kind of jump in there and um, take advantage of that. Simply painting the trunks with that 50-50 mixture of white latex and water can really help to an early, do it early on when you first establish the trees. Um, <clears throat> it can really deter the egg laying which can deter this. So it's one of those things that you gotta pay. You got you have to do it early on, but by doing it early on and paying attention to that early on, then you're able to combat issues down the road. Plum curculio. I'm sure many of you have seen this on apples. It's this little weevil that um, it and it actually overwinters in hedgerows and sheltered areas, um, and it will emerge from newly formed fruit um, at petal fall. Uh, and what you're seeing is really the females that deposit the eggs uh, under the fruit and causing that's what causes these scars. So oftentimes the fruit, the infested fruit, will drop in early June. Um, and chemical, you, you can kind of live with it, um, but, and there, but there are chemical control options if it is an issue and you would spray them three weeks after bloom. But another thing would be simply picking up any fruit that has fallen to the ground and discarding it and destroying it will help to knock back those issues. Um, also trying to manage your hedgerows in your areas uh, 
uh, nearby your trees will help to combat this issue as well, because that's where they're hiding out. Uh, mites, they cause this bronzing issue, this discoloration um, on the leaves. You'll have to, but you've got to flip the leaf over. Um, if you see this kind of discoloration on your leaves, if you flip the leaf over and you see some sort of movement on the bottom of the leaves, on the undersides of the leaves, and it's probably mites, it's really common in hot, dry weather. Um, so I've been getting some of those phone calls, actually. Um, natural enemies is some of your best, so, so beneficial insects is one of your best control methods. Uh, you can spray insecticides, but it's kind of an uphill battle with that, so I don't really suggest it because it's a constant battle when it's hot, dry weather. It's hard to really keep it back. So just having good natural enemies and um, some beneficials like ladybugs and praying mantis and that sort of thing. For a home, home um, orchard, I would say is one of your best bets if this becomes a major issue. San Jose scale. Um, I have peaches and apples here because you see it both in apples and peaches. <clears throat> this is... Um, an insect that'll kill trees and will damage fruit. It'll actually suck the sap from a tree. And it's best managed, again, with the dormant oil and pruning of infested branches. Apple scab is a uh, big one, as we saw in that video. It'll, it can actually defoliate an apple tree and obviously cause those blemishes in the fruit. Your best way, I would say, of handling it uh, is cleaning up the leaf litter at the end of the season, just making sure that you rake up all those leaves and you get them out from your orchard and you, you throw it away, you get rid of it um, because that's what's going to break up your disease cycle. The inoculum, the fung fungal spores are actually coming up from those leaves that are in the ground. Fire blight is a huge issue on apples. This is also a major issue on pears, actually arguably more of an issue on pears. It's a bacterial disease and what it does is it it gives this scorched look. It looks as if the branches were scorched with a blowtorch, and then it creates the shepherd's crook ends up occurring on these branches. Um, that's its telltale sign. So if you see a blackened area with a shepherd's crook, you probably have fire blight. Uh, it's spread if you have it's it's wind driven. Wind driven rain is really um, the main mover of. Uh, fire blight, but also insects and pruning tools. So it's bacterial. So the idea is that if you have if you have this wetness and then you move these bacterial spores around and but it's incredibly um contagious. Uh and control is really best by for a homeowner, you remove a branch at least eight to twelve inches below where you see obvious diseased tissue. And then once you've removed it, you really want to make sure that you clean your tools and you disinfest them, not just with a cloth or something, but with a 10% bleach solution. It's incredibly important because you can easily spread fire blight from branch to branch to branch to tree to tree to tree and then end up with a way bigger issue. Um, and you also want to make sure that you completely get rid of those branches. Do not just let them drop in your orchard. So Megan, for uh, cleanliness on that, we're going to yeah. wipe off the sap off of those pruning tools first and then Correct. in that pruning solution, for how long do they need to have that in the, prune, in the uh, bleach solution? It, it, you could just, I put it in a spray bottle and just spray your tools down with, spray your tool down with it, wipe it off, and then move to the Great. next thing. Yeah. Great, thank you. Cedar apple rust. Uh, so <clears throat> this is another fungus that will actually defoliate an apple tree and it'll blemish the fruit. The telltale sign is you see these red splotches on the top of the leaf, but when you turn it over, you're going to see these funky little um, sporulating bodies. Um, they're actually quite cool looking. Uh, that, that's how you know you have cedar apple rust on the tree. Um, infection occurs uh, at temperatures between 46 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit, um, so really a springtime issue. The primary way to handle this is to uh, not have any cedar trees if you're going to grow apple trees um, because that's your secondary host. It grows on the cedar tree and then that sporulates and then it lands on the apple tree and then the apple tree sporulates and then the fungus goes back to the cedar tree. So if you break the disease cycle, the only way to break it um, truly is to uh, um, cut down and destroy those cedar trees. 
and that's honestly what commercial growers will do. Are there any other questions in relation to apples? I gave a broad overview on apples, and then I'm going to just highlight a couple other diseases that are more specific to the others. Megan, there's a question on when you use that white wash. Yeah. How far up? It's like up to the first set of branches, right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Thanks, Megan. Come All right. Moving on. So pears, there's a lot of similarity between pears and um, apples, being, both being palm fruit. You don't have as many varieties to choose from that I would suggest for home um, backyard uh, production. Just three, Bartlett, Bosque, and Gorham. Uh, and you also do not ha nearly have the choice in rootstock. You really only have one choice right now. We're actively doing research to find other choices. But this, um, this cross, Old Home times Farmingdale, OHF, I think is what they say, what they have is a, um, the shortened version, has fire blight resistance, which is very important. Some cultivars will self-pollinate and some will, can cross-pollinate. So it's important to ask your nursery uh, specifically about um, what would be the best pollinator for your, the variety you're looking for. Your pruning would also be mid-March. It's similar pruning as apples and similar central leader um, methods. So having that one shoot as a central leader and taking off those major cuts, just as we talked about with apples, is what you're shooting for. Um, just to show you again, kind of that Christmas tree look with that central leader is what you want with a pear tree. Fire of light, like I said before, is your major pest that you're dealing with with pears, um, and it has significantly limited the growth of pears in New Jersey. They're magnets for fire blight, unfortunately. Pear facilla, that's an insect. Um, it's the most common insect of pear trees, and dormant oil is your main control method for that. Uh, the nymphs will secrete a sticky honeydew and lead to the city mold. Um, which actually can cause defoliation and crop loss. So dormant oil is your, your main solution for that. Do you have any quick questions on pears? I can just kind of go through a couple. Yes, yeah, sir, for that dormant oil, uh, yeah. just to describe when that's going to be used. That's, again, at a uh, half-inch green tip. So once, the, once you start to push out growth, um, leaf growth from your buds. You don't want to go too much beyond that because then you can actually cause damage to some of the fruit that start to grow. Thanks, Megan. Yep. Now stone fruit. So stone fruit would encompass your peaches, your cherries, your plums, and your apricots. In terms of your varieties, you have a lot of different varieties that you can grow for peaches, depending on what, what you like, a yellow flesh versus white flesh um, of peaches and nectarines. That peaches and nectarines fall into the same category, really, in terms of management practices. One just has fuzz and the other doesn't have fuzz, truly. You don't have as much choice of rootstock at all. You have Lovell or Tennessee Natural, and they're both going to be about 12 to 15 foot trees. So you don't have that dwarfing um, quality. However, you can prune peach trees quite heavily and they're still going to put on good fruit for you. So it's not as much of a worry. Um, you can kind of shape it into a more dwarfing characteristic or you can purchase a cultivar to the top portion, the variety that's a more columnar shape or a shape that you would, is a little easier for you to manage. Another huge benefit, which I like about peaches, is you don't need a pollinator. So you can have just one tree, one peach tree, and you're going to have peaches off of that tree because it will self-pollinate. Uh, peaches are pruned in late March through early April, so a little bit later, um, before they start to have bud swell, I would say. So you see these nice little pink, pink uh, balloon-like buds that you have on peaches. It's just before that starts to occur that you're going to be pruning peach trees. They're unique in that they bear on one-year-old wood. So when I say that, I mean... You could prune them really, that's why when I say you can prune them really heavily and you're going to have a, probably still have a really good crop because you prune them heavily, you'll have a lot of shoots growing and all those shoots are going to produce fruit for you the next year. That's also why it's so important to thin peaches because they just put on so much fruit. You want to make sure that you prune peaches though when it's dry, um, ideally 60 degrees Fahrenheit, two to three days after pruning because that helps to minimize any diseases that are coming that could come into those pruning cuts. 
Peaches most traditionally get pruned to an open vase, but you can prune them um, in some other creative ways. I'm going to just go over open vase quickly here. So what we mean by that is you have three to five scaffold branches. So you can see in the previous slide that this tree has three, maybe four scaffold branches. Um, those are your big, biggest branches. And then off of that, it's like you have other little trees growing. So you're going to remove your strongest, most upright shoots, um, shoots that are drooping, any that are crazy vigorous in the middle of that vase. Um, and of the shoots that you leave, you want to have, at the end of pruning, about 75 to 90 straight pencil thick branches. That's what you want to think when you're pruning peach trees. You want to have these main scaffolds and then off of them, it's been described to me as having almost a fish bone <clears throat> where you have that main, the main um, bone in a fish and then you have all these little branches, little bones coming off of it side by side. That's how we describe having a peach tree pruned too. And those little branches, you should make sure they're all pencil thick. Anything that's thinner than a pencil is not going to produce good fruit. And anything that's thicker than a pencil, you can get out of there unless it's your scaffold branch because it's going to shade out other branches. So I actually think peaches are pretty straightforward to prune if you keep in mind that that's what you're looking for, pencil thick branches um, and keeping it in that vase shape. In terms of pest issues or disease, any abiotic, biotic issues that you see, again, the low temperature injury is an issue and that white washing, the white paint on the trunks will also help you to prevent that um, with peaches. You can't, <clears throat> it's difficult to prevent, um, I would say some of the freezing injury that you'll see sometimes in some springs, like this past spring, there is uh, definitely a lot of injury on peaches where it got really cold in some of the main bloom days. And so a lot of the peaches got killed, got, um, the flowers got really hurt and weren't able to produce fruit. Um, another thing that just reminded me of is that it's important to I would say to purchase varieties, if you can purchase varieties that were developed in the Northeast or in cooler climate, often the peaches that were bred in California, if there is that information in the catalog that you're reading where it was bred, if it's bred in California, often it doesn't have the cold hardiness that you need to be able to withstand the springs that we have here in New Jersey. Um, going back to diseases, brown rot is the major issue that you'll see. I'm sure you've seen that in some peaches. It'll even um, put on some of that brown rot once you've, if you've harvested it and it's sitting on your counter. The spores are released during rainy periods in spring and summer, and they will infect the blossoms and the fruit. And the spores will overwinter on infected twigs and blossoms and the fruit. So your main way to be able to stop that um, is to destroy anything that looks diseased. So any branches that look diseased, any um, making sure you get all the fruit out, any fruit that's dropped to the ground, get it out of the, um, get it out of your yard, um, remove it, and that'll help you reduce your infection significantly. Cytospora canker is another common issue that you'll see in all stone fruit, so apricots, plums, nectarines, and cherries. It can girdle scaffold branches and reduce yield, and it can even kill trees. It it causes that oozing amber dark brown gumminess um, near the point of infection. Um, it's fairly common, um, and beneath that gumminess, the inner bark will actually collapse, and you'll see a canker forming. To be able to control it, so cutting it out is one method. Um, you don't want to have extra stressors, such as peach tree borers, um, which can also be combated by spraying on that white latex paint. It's an important, um, good tool. Uh, fertilizing in early spring and planting cold hardy cultivars helps too. So any injury, it's kind of opportunistic um, where it'll come in there and it can um, infect and then uh, end up causing these issues and cankers. But it's You'll actually see it, so keep in mind, this is more of an amber color, and I'll show you another one um, in the next slide where it's more its a, more of a clear color that'll be coming, like a gumminess out of the fruit. Bacterial spot is a super common issue that we see in peaches all the time. You see the spot, these spots on peach tree leaves. It's often, it's sometimes very challenging to tell the difference between that actually and a nitrogen issue, because that'll also cause spots on the leaves. 
Um, but if you know you're fertilizing adequately, then uh, nine times out of 10, it's actually bacterial spot that you're seeing. Um, by having good aeration, that's one way to handle it. Cleaning up leaf litter, again, helps you to knock back that inoculum. Um, and planting resistant varieties. So a lot of varieties that I had mentioned in the first slide there um, have resistance to bacterial spot. That's one of the main um, diseases that they have bred resistance to. Plum curculio um, is also an issue in peaches and San Jose scale. Um, like I mentioned before, that insecticides can can handle that, and also the whitewashing um, and the dormant oils. Peach tree borer is another issue um, that is seen. This will actually feed on the inner bark of the peach as well, um, and it um, just will cause uh, just lack of vigor, really. So the, the borers will deposit their eggs at the base of the trunks. So the way in which you can actually control that from a homeowner standpoint is, again, to paint the trunks with that white latex and water. It really helps that a simple tool like that, it just prevents the egg laying. And then the lack of being able to, or they're, they're not able to lay those eggs, or those eggs are when they're actually um, opening up, these little insects, they can't get past the latex layer. So it's actually a really interesting tool that you have. Cherries, there are two main ty types of cherries um, that you can be planting. You can plant tart cherries or sweet cherries. Tart cherries will self-pollinate. Montmorency and Bailaton are the ones that I would suggest. Montmorency has, a, I've heard of a lot of people having a lot of success with Montmorency um, uh, in, in their backyards. Sweet cherries are a little more challenging. Um, they do not self-pollinate, and oftentimes they won't pollinate back and forth. So uh, one cherry A will pollinate cherry B, but cherry B will not pollinate cherry A. So it can, it can be more complicated um, to be uh, growing those. We do have some rootstocks, the Gisela series. Or anything with Gisela in the name of the rootstock is a dwarfing rootstock, but even as a dwarfing rootstock, they're not super dwarfing, unfortunately, for cherries, you're still looking at trees that are upwards of 20 foot tall. So keep that in mind. They are very large trees. Um, so you'd have to have a very big backyard. There are a lot of different ways in which you can prune a cherry tree. I would suggest, um, if you want to do this in your backyard, to prune it to a bush shape. And really what you're doing there is just t cutting the tips off um, about six to eight inches. Uh, and you do that right after harvest. So, in com so it's very different um, from all these other tree fruits that I described, and that you're pruning cherries after harvest, and that's important because that help that um, we have some major disease issues for cherries that will really wipe out um, your trees very quickly if you do not prune them um, after they harvest, and you prune them after they harvest. This, it's the better time because it will help the, the wounds will heal better um, because it's actively growing during that time. Now, I get this question all the time, and this is really for a lot of different um, crops that uh, birds really like. I haven't actually tried it on raspberries or blueberries, but I would imagine it would work in a similar way. Grape soda that has this particular, just the grape soda that you can get in the grocery store, um, some, if not all, will have this particular chemical in it. Birds do not like that chemical. Um, and so that's one deterrent, aside from netting, uh, that you can help, that helps you uh, to preserve your cherry crop. But we actually use that at our um, research farms. Brown rot and cytosper canker are also, also issues on cherries, as they were with peaches. Black knot is a specific issue to cherries, also an issue to plums. It causes these big black enlargements. Um, and pruning them out in winter or early spring and destroying them, so pruning them eight inches below where you see that big knot and that enlargement and destroying that will help you combat the disease, although it can be really challenging once it's taken hold of the tree and really gotten into it. Um, that's another one where you want to clean your pruners with a 10% bleach solution after each cut. Just spray them down. Uh, 
if you allow the disease to build up, then it just can really take over the tree, and then you need a really, really severe pruning. I have one more spot for questions before I finish up with apricots and plums. Well, there's a lot more questions on whitewashing. Yeah, I, I think you probably covered most of it, though. Okay. They, were, they were asking if I had to repeat applications, and I would say yes. Yeah. Yep. Well, you do. And yep. Once it starts fading. Okay. We do it about every other year on our trees. Simple solution for homeowners. It is. It really is. It's an awesome solution. There's just a couple of tools that can really help you out to get things get things rolling in your backyard. All right, jumping into apricots and plums then, I guess. Apricots can be challenging to grow. They can be challenging to grow because they can't really handle those big dips in our dips in temperature in the springtime. That's what we often say to people. They're not impossible to grow though. I would say it's been really challenging lately, but roughly every third or fourth spring, then you can get a good crop. So if you're willing to be patient and only get a crop every couple of years, um, then by all means, go for it. Try to grow apricots and plums. Um, we have some growers that grow them successfully in northern New Jersey. Uh, it also depends on where your area is. If you don't tend, if you happen to not get really, really low temperatures, um, Big dips in temperatures if, you, if you're more moderate and where you are in your location. And honestly, I've seen orchards that are five miles from each other, but one just happens to be at a slightly higher elevation, and they can manage to grow these fruit just fine. Um, so it depends on your area. Anyway, um, I'm basically saying don't be totally deterred by it. So there are a number of different apricot varieties. Some of these have actually been bred at Rutgers University, and the ones that have been bred at Rutgers have been bred for uh, cold hardiness, of course. Um, there are no notable choices in rootstocks quite yet uh, for apricots. So um, you're not going to really have any dwarfing or significant disease resistance, uh, unfortunately, in the roots. They will self-pollinate them. In terms of plums, um, we have three different varieties, well, four different varieties, uh, or three different varieties and one rootstock, um, mirobalan, uh, which is well adapted to a wide range of soils. Uh, and they're about 15, that'll uh, grow to the tree to about 15 foot tall. It, they're semi self pollinating, so you got to go variety by variety to see which one. Um, what the particular cultivar that you're looking at would require. In terms of pruning, I'm kind of doing these side by side, the apricots and the plums. So for the apricots, the pruning is very similar to a peach. You'd be growing them in a vase system. The difference is that they're significantly larger trees, really. They'll grow, you don't have that dwarf, you don't have anything um, about the rootstock that'll really dwarf those trees for you. So you have to keep that in mind that they're gonna get pretty big. Um, like I said before, 15 to 20 foot tall. In terms of plums, it depends on what kind of plum you have. If you have a Japanese plum, the suggestion is, uh, based on the growth habit, to prune it to more of a vase shape, so like the apricot or the peach pruning method with the three to five scaffolds. Uh, the European plums, you would prune them to more of a pyramidal central leader shape and you would keep that leader 24 to 30 inches above the highest scaffolds. Now in terms, like I said, your abiotic issues, um, they just, the reason, part of the reason that it's such an issue is that they'll, um, once the temperatures start warming up just a little bit, they'll bloom. They bloom really early, plums and apricots. Unfortunately, our springtime temperatures don't stay, stay moderate that early. But if you happen to be in an area that's cooler for longer and doesn't necessarily have those big zips in temperatures, then you might have some success. Um, I have talked to growers up in Warren County that have had they a perfectly good crop, honestly, of apricots and plums um, year after year because it stays cool for a longer period of time. And once it warms up, it warms up for good. In terms of some of your issues that you see, like I said before, black knot's a major issue like it is on plums and brown rot, or like it is on cherries and brown rot, it, like just as if, 
it's an issue on peaches, it's also an issue on plums. So you have the same uh, management methods for both of those also in plums. Some of your issues in apricots, your major issues would be plum curculio and scale. Similar um, methods with your dormant oil of handling them. Do you have any other questions? That, that um, concludes my talk for this evening. I'd be happy to answer them. Or feel free to email me if you have any other questions that, that you have on Tree Group. Yeah, actually, uh, email might be a good option. Megan, that was spectacular. We really appreciate you sharing all your knowledge with us tonight. Uh, I want to genuinely thank Megan Neil Bauer for being with us tonight. I want to thank the, all the freeholders throughout the state and the counties that provide support for Rutgers Cooperative Extension. Um, throughout the state, we have many supporters, and we wouldn't be here without the generous support of our county freeholders. I also want to genuinely thank uh, New Jersey Ag Experiment Station. Uh, the New Jersey Ag Experiment Station is really the mothership that we all work for that um, provides the base research and all the extension specialists and provides support for all of our uh, county extension agents as well. So we wouldn't be here without the uh, generous funding and support uh, of the New Jersey Ag Experiment Station as well and the USDA. And Megan, I want to thank you once again for doing an outstanding job today. We really appreciate your sharing all of you with us today. That was a, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.